This is mudslinging. This is trying to poison our parliamentary environment with a litany, a list of, I don't know what, you know what? The partisan, the partisan... I seem to have touched a nerve with that member of parliament, and I'm sorry that she has to be part of a government that's so corrupt. I can... Orders of the day. Orders of the day, Old Jour, resuming debate on the sub-amendment of Mr. Muse to a privilege motion concerning the failure to produce documents pertaining to Sustainable Development Technology Canada. In debate, the Honourable Member from Kildonan, St. Paul, has 20 minutes. Mr. Speaker, the House of Commons now has been ground to a halt for over two weeks because the Liberal government refuses to comply with an order of this House to permit the distribution of the documents concerning a $400 million scandal, a corruption scandal. This is heights that we have not seen in quite some time, a scandal of quite epic proportions. And the Liberals have gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure that the public, that the RCMP, that this House does not gain access to the critical documents that would show what really went on in this so-called green slush fund scandal, which I will get into momentarily. I think what's really important to note is the Auditor General of Canada, which is of course a non-partisan uh, auditor of this, of this House and of government spending, found that again almost $400 million of misused taxpayer dollars and 186 conflicts of interest, 186 conflicts of interest, notably from nine board members from this Green Slush Fund. Nine people, 186 conflicts of interest, totaling about $400 million. This House has been ground to a halt because the Liberal government refuses to reveal the documents that you yourself, Mr. Speaker, have said the House ordered for and they failed to comply. And they have used a whole magnitude of different excuses. In fact, they can't quite seem to get their story straight of why they don't want to give those documents to Parliament as it's ordered. And we will get into that as well, sir. So again, all of parliamentary business has been ground to a halt for two weeks because of the refusal to comply. And so I want to talk a little bit about what exactly went down at this Green Slush Fund because it's quite interesting and the tendrils into Liberal insiders go quite deep, Mr. Speaker. So what we've been calling the Green Slush Fund refers to something now defunct, a foundation of government called the Sustainable Development Technology Fund Canada, or Technology Canada, SDTC. And it was a foundation set up by then Liberal government in 2001 and it was, had the purpose of providing taxpayer funds to green technology in essence. And it's since carried on for a number of decades and is now defunct, another, another foundation, another group, another organization that's just in the graveyard of liberal corruption, another fatality of their liberal insider behavior. And certainly the government of the day appoints a number of the board members for this, this fund, we'll call it. And so certainly a number of the board members would have come across the Prime Minister of the Cabinet discussion he would have signed off on them. That's important to remember. These are Prime Minister appointed many of the board members on this fund. And certainly since the Liberal government was elected in 2015, things really did take a turn in this foundation. And as I said, the Auditor General of Canada found the Liberal government turned this foundation into what, what is in essence a slush fund, where Liberal, mem liberal appointed insiders to the board funneled money to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars to their own companies. To their own companies. Liberal appointed board members funneled money into their own pockets. That's what we're talking about, to the tune of $400 million with 186 conflicts of interest proven by the Auditor General. And just beyond that, just to get into a few more of the details, the Auditor General found that the fund gave $58 million to 10 ineligible projects that did not fall under the scope of what that fund was supposed to provide, so they shouldn't even have got a penny, let alone almost $60 million. And of course, as I said, there was $334 million with 186 cases to projects which board members held conflicts of interest. Of note, nine of the directors of the board, again, had 186 of those conflicts. So they were very busy during the few years they were on that board, Mr. Speaker. And again, $58 million of projects went to, went, uh, of money went to projects without ensuring contribution agreements were made. So there was just, not only was there conflicts of interest, but they weren't even doing their due diligence on the ones that weren't enriching themselves. Just an utter mess and disregard and respect for the hard-earned taxpayer dollars they were just throwing out the door with no regard for how it would, what it would mean to the ethical behavior of government. 
again, in a five-year period, just some of the, the Auditor General did quite interesting work here. She looked at, over a five-year period, there were 405 transactions approved by the board. The Auditor General herself sampled 226 of them, so just over half, and found, again, that's where she found 186 conflicts of those 226 transactions, which ultimately is 82%. So 82% of those that she looked at were conflicts, where someone benefited from their own decision to sign over money. And she made it very clear in her report that the blame for this scandal falls on the Liberal government's industry minister who, quote, did not sufficiently monitor the contracts that were given to Liberal insiders. Again, this fund was responsible for almost a billion dollars and was sort of, they weren't even really, according to them, not even really paying attention. As if a billion dollars is a sort of change you find in the bottom of a Liberal pocket and nothing really that we should be concerned about. But of course, now we've ground, they've ground the House to a halt for two weeks because they're so concerned about it. I did want to talk a little bit about some of the conflicts of interest that were found because they are quite interesting, Mr. Speaker. There was a board member named André Lise Meto. She was appointed to the Green Slash Fund in 2016. She runs a venture capital firm called Cycle Capital. Remember that name, Cycle Capital. It's in the green technologies field. I believe it's some sort of venture capital investment fund that takes that gets investment dollars from government and elsewhere, and then invests it in other green technology companies, what have you. And before and during her time, Ms. Meto's time on the board, her company received a quarter of a billion dollars in grants from the Green Slush Fund. Quarter of a billion dollars to cycle capital. Some of that was before, again, that she was on the board. But while she was on the board, $114 million went to green companies that she had herself invested in. $114 million. Personally approved, enriching herself. Liberal appointed. And what's interesting, during her time on the board, again, it certainly pays to be a liberal insider, Mr. Speaker, the value of her company, again, Cycle Capital, tripled. And no wonder, with a stamp of approval from the federal government, a company sort of has that gravitas that they're a trustworthy company or some, something like that in the sense that others can invest in you because, well, the federal government has. So her company, with these investments from taxpayers through the Green Slush Fund, tripled its investment or tripled its value. And I do want to talk about some of the lobbyists for Cycle Capital, because you may be familiar with them, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure you know who the environment minister is for the Liberal government. He's quite a notable or notorious, whichever word you choose to describe him, uh, member of the Liberal cabinet. And when he, before he was elected, he lobbied the Prime Minister's office and the Department of Industry 25 times for Cycle Capital. And at that time, Cycle Capital received $111 million. So to his full credit, very successful lobbyist for this company. And of course, when he was part of the company, he received shares of Cycle Capital that he still holds today. Good for him, Mr. Speaker, because in the time that that company that he lobbied for, and he still owns their shares, those shares have tripled in value. Sure pays to be a liberal insider, Mr. Speaker. And again, it's reasonable to assume that he's made quite a bit of money, and good for him. But what's very odd, I think, to taxpayers is the idea that you can lobby the government dozens of times, bring in tons, millions of dollars to a company, then get elected and be at the cabinet table where these appointments are approved, and then the people that you know that you used to lobby for go onto this green slush fund, funnel more money to that company, and your shares as part of that company triple in value. Wow. I don't know about you, Mr. Speaker, but if any of the Canadians watching or Quebecois watching are thinking how they can get ahead in this economy, all they have to do is start a tech company and get hundreds of millions of dollars from the Liberal government, so long as they're a Liberal insider. I think we're all in the wrong business if we wanted to get ahead in this country under Liberals, because they're doing a very good job lining their own pockets. And so what's more interesting, Ms. Meteau, again, head of Cycle Capital, left the Green Slash Fund in 2022 and went on to another Liberal board the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which, Mr. Speaker, you'll be very familiar, is ultimately a failed board that has taken in billions of dollars to build infrastructure. I don't believe they've completed one project in the almost 10 years that this government's been in power and been talking about this infrastructure bank. It's had a whole host of problems, CEOs coming and going. But anyway, so she went over to that one after she took all that, or, uh, approved all that money for her own company and others that she had financial interest in. And while she was at the infrastructure bank, she voted to give $170 million for a company owned by the recent chair, Annette Vichurin, of the Green Slush Fund. Annette Vichurin was appointed by the Prime Minister to the Green Slush Fund. They're all connected, these folks. All the Liberal insiders, a great little rich party of people taking a lot of taxpayer money is what I found when researching this topic. 
Now, Annette Vichurin was found guilty of giving her own company money when she was on that board. And because of that, or that's when the Ethics Commissioner of Canada, so we have the Auditor General saying this is not good. We also have the Ethics Commissioner saying this is not good. The Ethics Commissioner found Ms. Vichurin guilty of breaking ethics law, which again is a running theme with this Liberal government. We know the Prime Minister himself was found guilty twice. Another of under, other Liberal ministers also found guilty. And their friend who they appointed to the Green Slush Fund funneled money of taxpayer dollars to her own company and was ultimately found guilty by the Ethics Commissioner for doing so. She broke the law. Her company also received $12 million from other government's funds and $50 million from Natural Resource Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when people ask sometimes, well, like how are, how are Conservatives going to fix the budget? This is how. The gravy train will come to an end for Liberal insiders, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about, thank you, uh, we're talking about $400 million. That's a good place. That's a good place to end the gravy train and save taxpayers some money and look to balance the books, Mr. Speaker. And this is time and time again. This is by far not the first time we're talking about a misuse of taxpayer dollars. And there really is a number of these very shady individuals, or maybe they're good individuals, but they're certainly good at getting money for themselves when they, appoint them, when they get appointed to this board. Like another guy, I'll talk about him just briefly because he's interesting. Guy Umet, he admitted, he was on the board, and he admitted in committee testimony that $17 million of green slash fund money went to companies in which he held financial interest. What was really interesting about this, Mr. Speaker, these people are so rich, they don't even understand what $17 million is. He said it was a small amount of money. A small amount of money, $17 million. Meanwhile, we have 2 million Canadians going to food banks, and Liberal insiders are saying, well, it's just a small amount of money. I don't know what the big deal is. It's quite embarrassing. It's quite embarrassing. And the value of that company since it got government funds went up 1,000%. Sure pays to be a Liberal insider. And how about the Green Slush Fund director, uh, Stephen Kukacha? He's from British, British Columbia. He was a political staffer to former, a former Liberal Environment Minister. He was also an organizer for the Liberal Party for the Prime Minister in British Columbia. And as a reward, he got a board appointment to this Green Slush Fund. And during his time on the board, the company that he, companies he held financial interest in received $5 million. And again, at committee, he also said that's just a small amount of money. So, you know, not a big deal. I'm laughing because it's just so outrageous that millions of dollars would be seen as not a big deal. But again, it pays to be a liberal insider. And of course, we know liberals are, again, as I said, using a lot of different excuses for why they shouldn't have to obey uh, an order from parliament. And I wanted to get into a few of them, although I know my time is limited. They talk about how... Somehow, the idea that Parliament will compel documents that may have the names of all the other people that have received money, that may really bring to light the magnitude of this beyond even what we know from the Auditor General, they're saying that somehow demanding the documents that might contain these names is sort of somehow a violation of their charter rights to be held accountable for possible defrauding the government, for having corruption against the government, that somehow... Canadians have no right to know how taxpayer dons, uh, dollars were funneled into their pockets. I think if their names are on those papers and they're found to have defrauded the government, then they should be held accountable. And that's really what this whole place is about, Mr. Speaker, as you'll know. This whole parliamentary process, the reason we're not a dictatorship is not just because we go to the ballot box every few years and get to freely choose our governments. It's also because we have a system of democratic principles, rules and procedures that hold power accountable, that hold power accountable. Ultimately, Parliament is supreme, and Parliament has ruled and demanded and ordered, ultimately, the production of these documents. And again, what we're debating, ultimately, is that privilege of the House was violated because the Liberal government refuses to hand over all the documents, and those that they did hand over, many of them were blacked out or redacted. But ultimately, the rules that govern parliamentary proceed. Uh, privilege are, are constitutionally on, on par with the Charter. And so if Parliament rules, we need to see those documents, they have to comply. They have to comply. So I just found that that argument was interesting and it almost seems as if the Liberals sort of default to saying the Charter whenever they're in trouble, as if the Charter is supposed to protect liberal, Liberals from their own corruption. I don't think so, Mr. Speaker. So the debate goes on and on and on in this place until they obey the ruling of the House and ultimately of the Speaker. I think Andrew Coyne actually said this really well today in the Globe and Mail. He said, quote, the right of Parliament to send for, quote, papers, persons, papers, and things, quote, is on, 
is one of the most ancient parliamentary privileges. It is crucial to the Commons' ability to act as a check on the executive. Again, this whole thing, our whole, the, the thing that's keeping us from a dictatorship is the fact that we have checks and balances on power. So I would ask that the Liberals be reminded of that, that they have a responsibility, a constitutional responsibility, to the checks on power that we apply to them. That's the reason we're all here. If we can't, if they can't, if they don't have to obey by an order of Parliament, we might as well all just pack up and go home and let the Liberals just be a dictatorship and decide whatever they want. But the, the opposition parties in this House collectively are demanding these documents. They are in a minority government, so they have to comply. The Speaker has ruled this, Mr. Speaker. So I do find that argument just is it a da- actually quite a dangerous territory for them, because what are they suggesting? That Parliament, we have no rights as parliamentarians. Again, what are we doing here then? So they go on and on. They're using tons of different excuses. One of the ones I found funny, actually, they're saying, well, this fund existed under Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper. How could you be criticizing it? Well, what's interesting, the Auditor General herself, actually, looked at the Green Slush Fund back in 2017, before it was a slush fund, and gave it a clean bill of health. So under Harper, it was well managed. Wow. But as soon as Liberals started to appoint the board members... That's when it went downhill. That's when Annette Vishuren, Ms. Vishuren, came into the picture and funneled money to herself and was found guilty of, the, of violating ethics law, a running theme. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how, just to conclude, how the Liberals really don't have a leg to stand on in this. If this was the first time, even, I mean, even if it was the first time, it's out. Uh, out Unbelievable that we're talking about $400 million and they somehow don't have to give up the documents that uh, Parliament has ordered. But it is not the first time. This is a running pattern in the last nine years. I'd like to talk about a few of those other instances. We'll remember, it was right when I was first elected, it was the We Charity scandal. Do you remember that, Mr. Speaker? It feels like a very long time ago. But that was a billion dollar scandal where liberals looked to give a billion taxpayer dollars to this, what was found to be quite a slimy organization that prior to getting that billion dollars, they promoted the Liberals at length, particularly the Trudeau family. They paid them money for various appearances. And uh, the former finance minister, Bill Morneau, was given a free trip. I think his daughter received some sort of benefit. So a very tight-knit, very almost fangirl-level organization to the Trudeau family was given a billion dollars. And of course, that got so heated that summer that, did they not prorogue Parliament? Yeah, they prorogued Parliament just to avoid. So, hmm, maybe that's coming. Watch for that, Mr. Speaker. If they prorogue Parliament, then you know we almost got them on something of true corruption here, because it happened back in 2020. And then the following summer, in 2021, we had the Winnipeg Lab documents. For the first time, and I think it was a century, there was an individual who came to the bar, was called to the bar, because Liberals were so desperate to avoid revealing the Winnipeg lab documents. Again, there was two, uh, two scientists from the Chinese Communist Party working in a Winnipeg lab, a high-ranking Winnipeg lab, looked to be taking very, very secret information from Canada, were marched out of that building, and there were all these documents about it. They were so desperate to stop the public from finding out they called a snap election, Mr. Speaker. So they don't have a leg to stand on when they say, well, we did nothing wrong, nothing to see here, really, because we've seen this before. And in fact, I could probably go on another 20 minutes about all the ethics violations of this government. You, of course, remember Aga Khan's billionaire island. Our prime minister loves his tropical vacations. And certainly in December 2017, the ethics commissioner found he violated ethics laws by taking a very, very hoity-toity fancy trip to a billionaire's tropical island with his, with his family and uh, certainly violated the rules of the law in that regard. And that was just the first time, the second time, You'll remember this as well, at SNC-Lavalin. Wow. It was quite the scandal. We'll remember the brave Jody Whistlin raybould spoke out against what she saw, the corruption she saw going on with the Prime Minister. He was found guilty of breaking ethics law at that time, inappropriately pressuring the Attorney General. Very serious matter, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, the, following, the election that came a few months later was when he lost his majority and never recovered. So the public has been really starting to see what, what's going on here. 
And I just wanted to conclude on something. You know, we talk about 400 billion, 400 million, all these big numbers. But what does that really mean to an individual person? I can't even. I have a difficult time understanding even how much a billion dollars is. It's just such a shockingly high number. But if you look at it, the average Canadian family or the average Canadian earns about $58,000 a year. Some more, some less, but the average is about $58,000. So if you have a two-parent household with two average incomes, that family pays on average about $18,000 of federal income tax. They work months out of the year away from their families. They have to deal with office politics, all kinds of things to go to work. We've got to pay our bills and support the public services. So they pay about $18,000 in federal taxes. Do you know how many families had to work an entire year to pay federal income tax so that liberal insiders can enrich themselves with $390 million? 22,000 Canadian families had to work their butts off so liberals can line their own pockets, Mr. Speaker. It's unacceptable, and we're going to hold them accountable for it. Questions and comments? I recognize the Honourable Member for Chateauguay la Colle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Listen to the, um, I guess you could call it a speech, uh, from uh, the colleague uh, opposite. Uh, and uh, for those in the gallery, uh, please be aware of what's going on here. This is mudslinging. This is trying to poison our parliamentary environment with a litany, a list of, I don't know what, you know what? The partisan, the partisan jabs, okay, we can take it. But when a member of this House goes after institutions like the Auditor General, like the RCMP Federal Investigative Forces, then that is beyond the pale. When they go after individuals, so by the way, uh, you know, because it's not something that I do, and I really feel sorry for the member that it, she seems to be a talented uh, person, that she's reduced to that. Uh, someone like Annette Vershuen uh, was actually a former advisor to Stephen Harper uh, and I believe to Jim Flaherty. Uh, I apologize to the honourable member. The honourable member for Kildone and St. Paul. And I would remind colleagues to ask questions no longer than one minute. Mr. Speaker, are you calling on me? That's clear. I think he is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I seem to have touched a nerve with that member of Parliament, and I'm sorry that she has to be part of a government that's so corrupt. I can understand why that's so upsetting. Faced with the facts, it is, it is hard to face to have any association with this Liberal government. I understand her angst.